Uh, hi, my name is Drew and I'm going to be walking you through the Arctic Fox 990 today. Uh, right up front here we have jacks on all four corners. Now this is the uh, Rico Titan wireless system. Uh, this is going to be controlled with a remote. Uh, orientation of that remote is going to be from the rear, so we're going to uh, take care of that when we uh, get to the entry door. Uh, but while we're looking here at the jack itself, I want to go ahead and point out that you do have a rubber plug here on the top of each jack. Uh, that's going to be your manual drive. So if we go ahead and remove that, uh, we can use a 3-8 uh, ratchet and extension. And that's going to allow us to go ahead and uh, raise these jacks up or down again in the event uh, of a power loss situation. Uh, nothing much going on in the cab over itself. Uh, we, of course, have your wiring there. Um, moving on, we have uh, your potable water fill here. Uh, this is how we're going to fill that onboard water tank. We're going to, uh, of course, remove the cap, uh, stick a drinking water hose uh, directly in there, fill it up to it overflows. Uh, once full, we cap it off. Now, this water is non-pressurized naturally, so we do need to use the onboard water pump uh, to go ahead and draw that up from the tank uh, and, and make it usable. Uh, dropping down here, we have your six gallon capacity uh, water heater. Now this is going to be a dual source water heater. Uh, what that means for you is it will run not only on 110 volt electricity, uh, but propane gas with 12 volt direct spark ignition as well. Uh, manufacturer has a few recommendations for the appliance uh, if it's going to be in storage for more than seven days it is very important that we do drain uh, drain the water heater so the steps to do so are very important from a safety standpoint uh, we want to make sure we, we we follow them correctly to avoid any uh, scalding or, or something like that so uh, number one uh, give it ample time to cool down a lot longer than you generally would think at least two or three hours uh, once you're fairly certain of the temperature, uh, we do need to then depressurize the tank itself. Uh, when depressurizing it, it's very important that we do not have any water, uh, new water flowing within the unit itself. So if we're, of course, using the potable water here, we're going to turn off that 12 volt water pump. If we're using the potable water, or excuse me, the city water connection, uh, that we physically either turn off the spigot or disconnect the hose there. So with no new water flowing into the unit itself, uh, we're then going to depressurize it. Now what we're going to do is we are going to use the hot side of any spigot within the unit or any fixture within the unit. Uh, whether that's the bathroom fixture, the kitchen fixture, or even this auxiliary shower out here. Uh, we're going to use the hot side uh, to do so. So we're going to turn the hot side of any fixture on. Uh, with no new water, again, flowing into the unit itself, we're going to see that water dissipate fairly quickly. Uh, what it's doing is again relieving the pressure from the tank. So once we've done that, uh, we see no new water coming from the, the hot side of that fixture. We're going to be safe to go ahead and uh, drain your water heater. So uh, from there, uh, we're going to get an inch and a sixteenth socket and extension, and we're going to go ahead and back that anode rod out. Uh, once we back that out, uh, that remaining four to five gallons of water is going to evacuate from this location. Uh, now this drain plug is not only your drain plug, but it is also your anode rod. Uh, what an anode rod does is it acts like a magnet for hard water deposits, calcification, things like that. They deposit on the, uh, on the anode rod, eat away at that, as again opposed to the inside of the water heater. So uh, it is a consumable part. I would expect to get a year or two uh, in between anode rod changes. Uh, you'll know the condition of it uh, because, excuse me, uh, it will start out uh, 12 inches by three quarter inch in diameter. Uh, by the time it's time to replace, it's going to be about the size of a pencil, uh, look very decrepit. So uh, source that from an RV dealer. Uh, again, expect to get a year or two in between use. Uh, now the water heater is empty. We're ready for storage. That's fine. Um, before returning the unit back to service, we do need to prime it or, or fill it with six gallons of water before we light it to, of course, avoid any dry firing scenarios. Uh, to do so, uh, it's going to sound very similar to, to depressurizing it, uh, but essentially the exact opposite. So if we are, uh, we're going to initially introduce water overall to the unit. Again, potable water, we'd flip on that 12 volt water uh, pump. City water, we're going to uh, physically turn on that valve or reconnect that hose, uh, whichever. 
Uh, so with water now flowing into the unit or present within the unit, we're again going to go to the hot side of any fixture and we're gonna turn that on. Now this time we're going to see that flow be very interrupted, very airy, uh, spitty. What it's doing is it's displacing the air within the unit and refilling it with six gallons of water. So by the time that flow normalizes at the fixture, that is your indicator that you do have a full six gallons of water within the unit and you can go ahead and start heating your water. Uh, now, as I mentioned earlier, it is a dual source water heater. Uh, you have a 110 volt heating element here uh, with a toggle switch behind that regulator. Now, most of these other, most of these units have switches on the inside as well. Uh, in the event that this does have a 110 volt heating element switch on the inside, uh, make sure that this is on uh, when used and you can go ahead and uh, use that secondary switch or that redundant switch to actually heat your water uh, in use. Now, you can run both sources at the same time. That's gonna give you the highest recharge rate, something like 17 gallons per hour. Uh, standalone propane is gonna be 15 gallons per hour. And that electric heat, 110 volt electric heating element is gonna be about at 11 gallons per hour. Uh, also very important when we talk about this appliance, not only this appliance, but all of the propane appliances within the unit, it is very important that we do protect them from the intrusion of mud divers and flying insects. Uh, you're going to do so by screening off these louvers as well as this grating here. Uh, mud divers are attracted to the smell of propane. Uh, they want nothing more to make this water heater or any, again, any of these propane burning appliances their new home. So a little bit of foresight can save you some money there in the long run because it's not cheap to get these uh, appliances cleared out uh, once they have uh, potentially nested within. Uh, up top here, we have a quick connect sprayer. Uh, you'll, of course, use this coiled hose uh, to make that connection. Uh, you have a locking collar. You'll slide back there, insert the mail in fully. Uh, once it clicks, you're locked in. You can, of course, choose hot or cold water there, uh, and you'll be ready to go. Very easy. Uh, when disconnecting, uh, very similar. Just uh, slide back that locking collar. Uh, go ahead and store that in a storage compartment. Uh, nothing too crazy there. Uh, we have your battery uh, drawer here. Now your battery bank is made up of two Group 24 deep cycle batteries. You do have a slide out tray here uh, where you can go ahead um, and there's a little yellow handle there. If we go ahead and move that out of the way, I guess towards the right, uh, that will allow this to come out. Uh, we can see those batteries. Now these are lead acid batteries. So what that means for you is they are going to carry some maintenance. Uh, Periodically, generally two or three times a year, we're gonna pull these vent panels up and we're gonna check the water level and we're going to refill with distilled water as necessary. So it's very important that we do maintain that water level. Uh, also, we're gonna to get to it uh, within the unit, but there is gonna be a battery disconnect built into the unit. Uh, that battery disconnect is very important to utilize for periods of long-term storage. What that's going to do is isolate these batteries uh, from the 12 volt system. Uh, keeping any nominal or phantom draws off of the system, which is going to further extend the life of the battery. So uh, we'll get to that again. We'll talk about that a little bit more. If I drop down low here, uh, we have your city water connection first up. Uh, that's going to be uh, any you know, RV camp, uh, any full-time running water source, you're gonna go ahead and utilize this. Uh, it is very important. Uh, water pressure becomes very important. So it is important that we do use a water pressure regulator uh, when we are, anytime we are using city water. So uh, generally that water pressure regulator is going to hook directly onto the water source, uh, then our drinking water hose onto that regulator, and then ultimately we're gonna make this connection by rotating uh, the hose connection there. Uh, right next to that, we have your black tank flush. Uh, now this corresponds with a jet inside the black water tank and it is specifically designed to help blast off compounded toilet waste, body waste, things like that. Uh, very helpful in keeping your sensors reading correctly and again keeping any uh, compounding issues uh, from taking place. Uh, it does have limitations though, so when we are utilizing this we want to be uh, absolutely certain how much water we're pushing into that tank and we want to make sure we don't overflow it. So uh, when utilizing this black tank flush, make sure we're watching the monitor panel on the inside and we're uh, watching that fill up and don't let it exceed two-thirds uh, full uh, because we want to don't want to cut it that close. So uh, we go on the inside. We see that monitor panel. We see this tank filling up. We're then going to run out here. We're going to pull the bladex valve and we're going to dump that water within the tank. 
and we're going to repeat as necessary until we're fairly certain that we have all of that uh, you know, stuff that's hanging on uh, from within the tank. Beside that, we have a solar plug. Uh, that is a ZAMP style solar plug that's going to be a direct connection to the battery. Uh, that's meant to utilize any portable solar uh, that you might be inclined to do so, any of those briefcase folding panels, uh, anything like that. Uh, idea being is that you can take advantage of solar without necessarily, uh, without necessarily parking your unit in direct sun. Make that easy connection, that plug and play connection here. Take your panel out into the sun, uh, directionalize it as necessary. That's going to allow you to take advantage of some solar. Uh, generally, those portable panels will act like a battery tender here for your battery bank. I wouldn't expect to get any crazy runtime, uh, but they will help extend uh, you out into that kind of boondocking scenario for a little bit longer. Uh, up here in this flip top, uh, we have your uh, cable satellite inlets. Uh, those are just going to be a pass-through connection to the designated TV area of the camper. Uh, that will allow you to feed those external, uh, external systems to the, the TV area, uh, whether that be an aftermarket satellite package uh, or a, a park cable service. Again, these are just standard RG6 cable fittings and they will pass through to the designated TV area of the camper. Uh, 110 volt power supply here, 30 amp 110 volt power supply is only going to plug into the unit one way. So if we go ahead and look here at the cord, we have two, slant, or one slant, or two slanted prongs, one L-shaped prong. Uh, if we line those up, we plug it straight in, give it an eighth inch turn. Uh, that's going to lock it on. Uh, then we do have this secondary collar here. We can screw down and lock it in further. Very secure connection, gonna keep anybody from tripping on it, uh, anything like that. Now, my number one recommendation I do make for any unit that I deliver is going to be the addition of a 30 amp surge protector uh, in line. A lot going on within these units electronically. Uh, that 30 amp surge protector is truly the only way you can protect yourself from substandard wiring, dirty power, surges, things like that. Uh, with any surge protector that's going to plug directly into the power source, and then your, your, your power supply as well as the unit are gonna be in line or down line from that. So it is gonna protect your cord, it's gonna protect your unit. Uh, if you have any questions on the products that we recommend or how to use them, uh, feel free to give our parts department a call. They'd be more than happy to go ahead and educate you on the uh, proper use uh, of those products. Uh, we have your propane uh, compartment here. Uh, it houses two 30-pound propane tanks. They will be full for you today, uh, held in place with a tension band. So if we go ahead and, and pop that loose, uh, we can, of course, then uh, allow us to remove that tank for service, of course, after we disconnected your uh, pigtail there. So open and close valve on the top. Uh, very standard operation when it does come to uh, propane tanks. In between the two tanks, we do have a regulator. Uh, as you can see, this, is, this will spin, and if, if you can see, there is a little indicator as to which tank you're drawing off of. Uh, does it automatically switch over if you have both of these service valves open, so be aware of that. Uh, and it does have a flow indicator, as we can see. It is turned green. Uh, that means we do have flow uh, or some propane in the tank. doesn't tell us how much, but uh, if these were empty, that's going to kind of pinwheel over to red. So. Um, remove, or replacing that back into service uh, is going to make sure we put that tension band so it's not coming loose going down the road. Uh, come down here and lock those. Uh, a lot going on within this compartment down here. Uh, this is going to be where our low point drains are housed, our freshwater tank drain, uh, as well as our dump valves uh, for plumbing. So. Um, if I go ahead and look here in this tank, in this compartment, again, kind of a lot going on. Uh, first up we see there is going to be our black water and gray water valves. Uh, so black water valve there and gray water valve there. Uh, black water is going to be anything that comes from the toilet, toilet ways, body ways, things like that. Uh, gray water is going to be the relatively cleaner of the two, which is just going to be sink water, shower water, things like that. Uh, very important that we keep these valves in the closed position and we only dump as necessary. So there's only two scenarios where you should be uh, dumping your tanks or opening these valves. Uh, number one, if the monitor panel is indicating that the tanks are full, go ahead and dump. Or if you're changing locations, moving from one spot to another, you can go ahead and dump at that time. 
Again, it's our goal, especially with this black water tank, to keep that in as wet or flowing condition as we can. We want, again, that toilet paper and that body waste to evacuate that, that tank uh, as easily as possible. And again, the only way to do that is keeping that valve in the closed position, keeping the contents as wet or flowing uh, as we can. Uh, also, treat these kind of like a vacuum lock. They should never be open at the same time. We, of course, want to avoid any back feeding uh, of our black water into our gray. A very popular scenario is going to be, uh, when, you, when you do go to dump, is going to be opening up that black water tank, uh, letting that drain completely. We then shut that valve. Then we open up the gray water. That's going to rinse any shared plumbing between the two, uh, as well as kind of rinse your sewage hose out uh, on the way down. Now, we have your bayonet style fitting here, uh, transitioning through the floor. That's actually where that waste is going to be evacuated. Uh, we do include a sewage hose with your purchase. Uh, that is going to connect here uh, the very same way this cap is removed. So you have four prongs along the outside uh, of that tube. That cap uh, slips over top. We put those keyholes in the halfway position. Uh, give it a turn to the right, that locks it on. Again, that's going to be the very same operation for your sewage hose. Even when you are hooked up to full-time septic, this procedure doesn't change, so that valve does need to remain in the closed position. Uh, also, in this compartment, we have your uh, low-point drains. Uh, we're going to see those um, here. So we have a low-point drain here. We have a low-point drain here. And then further back, we have a valve, and, and these are kind of all oh, hard to see. Uh, you have a valve back there, which is going to be your freshwater drain. Uh, so kind of hard to get our camera in that compartment, but uh, you can't miss them when you're actually here looking at them. So uh, manufacturer recommends, very similar to what we talked about with the water heater, that anytime the unit is going to be in storage for more than seven days, uh, it is very important that we drain the water from the unit to keep it from... Uh, you know, being stagnant or, or developing bacteria. Uh, so when you look in this compartment, you can't miss them. Just open up all three of those drains. Uh, that's going to drain the point A to point B plumbing as well as the uh, freshwater holding tank. Once we've opened all three of those valves, we're then going to walk up to the water heater and we're going to drain that, uh, the procedure that we outlined initially. So once we've drained these three lines, uh, drain the water heater. We're good to store the unit. Um, or if we're going to do like a full winterization process, uh, that's kind of the base for that. So from there, uh, we would then uh, introduce antifreeze to the system overall. Uh, again, protecting it from, from freezing weather, things like that. Uh, also in this compartment, we have a battery disconnect switch. Uh, that's going to be this red switch that is right there inside the compartment. Um, easy on off indicators. Now again, just a reminder that that is going to be uh, designed for periods of long-term storage. That's going to help keep any nominal or phantom draws uh, off of the system. So anytime you're storing the unit, go ahead and flip that over into the off position uh, with the caveat that you would remember to go ahead and return to the on position uh, before taking the unit out, reconnecting those batteries to the 12 volt system. So also within this compartment, we have your jack activation switch. If we go ahead and turn that on and see that green light like we do now, uh, that means that the jack is paired, uh, the jack remote is paired with the board and we're ready to go. Now, if we look at this jack here or this remote here, uh, orientation is gonna be from the rear. So I have my driver's side front jack, driver's side rear jack, passenger front, passenger rear, or all at the same time. Now, as long as that as long as that green light's on, that means I'm ready to go and I can go ahead and, and lift that up or down uh, utilizing the remote here. Again, I can fine tune those jacks individually or run them all at a relatively uh, similar pace, although it also is for independently geared motors. Uh, so keep in mind that they may be slightly out of sync. Uh, what we're looking for ultimately is that the front or the cab over, it never dips lower than the rear. And it's very important that we only leave that in the up position while we're loading and unloading it. Uh, it goes without saying, nobody should be inside the unit while it's being loaded or unloaded. And again, as soon as we've uh, backed our truck underneath of it, we need to go ahead and lower that down uh, on top of the truck. So when we are up in the air, that is kind of the most um, vulnerable moment uh, when it does come with these truck campers. 
Uh, now this is your, your main remote. This is battery operated. Again, it's a wireless system. Uh, but if this were to run out of battery on the road, you do have a way to connect it uh, to the board. Uh, on the inside of the unit, we're going to find a coiled uh, 3.5 millimeter cord. Uh, kind of looks similar to like an old handset uh, for a telephone, uh, telephone cord, I should say. Uh, what you're going to do is you're going to plug it here uh, into that, the top of the remote. You'll see a corresponding plug on the jack board and it, it no longer becomes a wireless system, but it still allows you to uh, operate it uh, up or down again in the event that this runs out of battery. Now, if this gets lost um, or damaged, um, you still have an option to uh, load it electronically. Uh, that's where this red remote comes into uh, play. Uh, now, this remote is, is very similar to the black remote. Uh, although it does not have batteries on it. So you can only operate this connected to the board. And again, you're gonna use that 3.5 millimeter connection to do so. Uh, that board uh, or that switch will time out automatically so you don't have to worry about turning it off. Although if you're inclined to do so, it does have a off position there uh, and, and you can do so. Alrighty, so here on the rear of the unit, uh, again, kind of a lot going on. Uh, up top, we of course have your awning. We're gonna go pull that out. Uh, when we do get to the inside, it is an electric awning, so uh, we'll flip that toggle switch when we get to the inside. Uh, same with the speakers. We're going to talk about those when we get to the inside. Uh, porch light is also switched on on the inside. Uh, so we're kind of clarify a lot of these things again when we uh, make our way uh, onto the inside. Uh, we have a fold down ladder here. Uh, this is in the travel position. Uh, also allows you to operate the, or to, to access the, uh, the generator storage location or the uh, manual override for the slide out. Uh, but while we're here talking about the uh, ladder uh, that gives you roof access, it's very important that we talk about structural maintenance uh, for the unit. So when we uh, are talking about either the roof or the sidewalls of the unit, they're going to utilize sealant uh, where anywhere where two pieces come together. Uh, generally here on the body, that's going to be a 100% silicone product. Uh, and you'll see, again, anywhere where two pieces come together, there, are, there is going to be a bead of sealant. Now, it is very important that every 90 days, we do a 360 degree inspection of the unit, and we are going to focus on uh, those places where sealant is laid down. We're looking for any degradation in sealant, whether that's going to be peeling, cracking, uh, separation, any of those things we want to catch immediately and touch up as necessary. So 100% silicone on the uh, body, on the roof, they're going to use a self-leveling lap sealant. Uh, generally, you're going to have to source that from an RV dealer. Uh, Dicor is generally the product that we use. Uh, and again, we're going to be looking for the same things up there. The application is slightly different because it's self-leveling, so you kind of lay it down with a heavy hand. But again, you're going to spot seal as necessary. Same with the body. Uh, we're looking for any degradation and we want to inspect it again every 90 days uh, to make sure we're catching any water intrusion issues as soon as possible. Uh, also here on the rear, we have a standard uh, RV style assist rail that's going to lock in the extended position. Uh, for travel, we can go ahead and fold it against the door there. Uh, that's going to not only keep it out of the way, but uh, keep the uh, door from, from potentially opening and going down the road. Uh, down over here, we have your uh, couple 110 volt all weather outlets. Uh, nothing too crazy there. Uh, tail lights, marker lights, things like that. License plate bracket. Uh, again, nothing, nothing too out of the realm. Uh, we have this uh, second step here that is removable to give you access here to the basement. Uh, very easy to do so. You have these uh, pins here. Uh, if we go ahead and pull those, they're kind of like spring loaded. So if we pull those out of the way just right, that's going to allow you to slide that off. And for now, I'm just going to move it out of the way. And then we can open up this door. And again, this is going to be access to uh, what they would call your basement. Uh, this has, a, again, that same similar style release as the battery does. Uh, this one we push into that back position and then we have this drawer, this metal drawer that's on rollers. It's going to allow you to store any long uh, objects that you may have to. It's very efficient use of space. 
uh, that would otherwise be wasted. So it's, it's nice to have that option. You also have the Fox Landing back here. Uh, now, when going down the road... Whoever was talking to Mr. Aikman, they're on line one. Now, Mr. Aikman is on line one. Now, when going down the road, uh, you can go ahead and fold this bottom step up, and then we can go ahead and pull this release here. That's going to allow that to uh, fold up and then it automatically locks back into that kind of stove position. It's going to stay up uh, again for, for travel. If I go ahead and lift that up, that comes down very easily. Fold the step down and we're ready for service. Uh, now over on this side, we have your uh, manual operation for your, excuse me, for your slide out. Um, this is of course in the event of a power loss situation. Uh, we don't want to have to drive down the road with our slide in the out position. So uh, we'll get eyes on it on the inside, but you're going to find a very large T-bar that's going to assist you in manually cranking this in. Uh, but before we do that, we need to disengage this motor, and we're going to do that with this switch here. So if we go ahead and flip that switch, that will allow us to go ahead and disengage that motor and, and uh, bring it in manually. Now, we put our our T-bar on that spline drive there, right next, to that, right next to that motor. I don't know if you can see that. So right there is gonna be the location. Again, not something that, that generally translates exceptionally well on film, uh, but when you're here looking at it, uh, you can't miss it. So, all right, so here in the generator compartment, uh, of course your generator is housed in this location. Uh, I don't anticipate you accessing it from, from you know, this scenario very often. Of course, once you do maintenance, things like that, uh, you will have to do so. Uh, generator is auxiliary switched on the inside. Uh, you do have a switch down here, but I find that most people, of course, uh, turn it on from that location. Uh, the reason why I have that access cover removed is we do have a, a breaker down here. Uh, now this is our outputting power breaker. It's a little yellow breaker. It's right underneath the power switch here. Uh, it is very important that we keep that in the up position. Uh, the generator will start and run normal, but uh, if that, if that uh, breaker is in the down position, it's not gonna output power. It's famously a soft breaker, so what happens is you'll hit a bump going down the road. Often enough, that's, that's enough to go ahead and trip that breaker. So again, uh, make sure that breaker's in the up position. If you fire up your generator and, and things aren't transferring over, uh, that's more than likely gonna be the, the case there. So down here we have a auxiliary propane port. Uh, this is gonna utilize that quick connect uh, connection. Uh, you slide back that locking collar, of course, insert the mail in fully. That's gonna snap back and lock back into position. Uh, this is utilized, uh, you can use this to uh, use any sort of high flow propane appliance, whether that's a gas grill, uh, propane fire pit, uh, propane heater, any of those, as long as it's a, a high flow pro propane appliance, uh, will work just fine with that. Uh, coming around here to the slide out, uh, not really much to note. Of course, we have your storage compartment here. Uh, this is going to be your furnace, uh, propane burning furnace with a 12 volt blower motor and direct spark ignition. Uh, this is the exhaust location, so make sure we're keeping that free breathing, make sure uh, we're not blocking that flow. Uh, also, uh, you'll want to go ahead and install a bug screen here at this location as well. Uh, this is a huge intrusion point for mud divers and flying insects. We talked earlier about the importance of keeping them uh, out of the propane appliances, and again, uh, protect that with a bug screen. Uh, back of your fridge panel here. Uh, again, from a maintenance standpoint, not too terribly much you're going to be doing back here. Uh, give it a visual inspection a couple times a year. Make sure nothing's gotten in. Make sure there's no nesting. Uh, make sure you don't have any frayed wires. Everything looks as it should. Uh, also, again, going to be an intrusion point for mud divers and flying insects. So it is important that we do screen uh, these vents off. Uh, and you do have a vent top and bottom, so keep that in mind. Uh, when replacing this vent, uh, we go ahead and put the tabs down first and we're going to seat those uh, just like that. And then we give these an eighth inch turn to the right there that locks it on. I always go back and give it a little tug, make sure that it is uh, in fact locked on. Uh, gonna take a look down low, make sure we haven't missed anything here. 
uh, underneath the slide and I think we're pretty good to go. Uh, so we're gonna hop on the inside and we're gonna take a look at those features. So right here inside the door, quite a bit going on. Uh, we have this little dimmer switch here. That's what they would call like a courtesy light. Uh, just a light that you are a familiar location uh, of a light that is close to the door that you can go ahead and turn on and allow you to light your way as you walk into the unit. Uh, we also have your slide room in and out switch here. Um, you know, is a, is a uh, momentary switch. We can bring that uh, fully in, fully out. Uh, just hold the button uh, in the direction you're choosing to uh, go. If I hop over here to the other side, we have your fire extinguisher. Uh, this is part of your safety equipment. It is very important that we do test our safety equipment uh, every single time we take the unit out. So uh, push the green tab down. If it springs back, that means we have life left. Uh, within the unit, it is still usable. If it stays depressed, and it's very important, we pull that out and replace it. Uh, down low here on the slide out wall, we have your awning in and out switch. Uh, again, that's a momentary switch uh, that is gonna correspond with this rear awning. Uh, and again, you hold it until it reaches your uh, position uh, that you wish to have that awning in or out. Uh, coming in here, we're going to hop into the restroom start talking about things like that. Uh, we have a porcelain bowl toilet with a uh, pedal flush. It'll be a light press to fill that bowl with water, full press to flush. Uh, toilet paper holder there. Uh, we have a uh, exhaust fan here. Now this is uh, to pull moisture from the air. A standard toggle switch there, a very standard basic uh, RV 12 volt exhaust fan. Uh, medicine cabinet uh, does have a magnetic uh, hold open there or uh, shut. Uh, sink, uh, hot, hot and cold uh, with a diverter. Um, so you would pull this up. That's going to divert the, uh, the water up here to the shower head, uh, which is going to have a on off switch on the actual fixture. Uh, that's to help you conserve uh, water uh, usage, uh, especially hot water usage. And then of course our light uh, has the toggle switch uh, right there on the uh, fixture itself. Uh, now coming out of the shower, uh, it's very important when we go down the road that we close the door and we're going to want to slide the, that lock down. That's going to keep that from swinging back and forth going down the road. Um, coming in, of course, you have your pantry here with the pull out drawer. Um, really nice, efficient use of space. Uh, again, storage down below here. Standard run-of-the-mill microwave, uh, turntable style microwave, very basic uh, in terms of function as well, uh, very much of what you're used to. Uh, down here we have your main ceiling light switch. Now a lot of people uh, have a hard time finding this. Uh, it is a dimmer switch, but it is going to control most of the overhead ceiling lights. Uh, we have your uh, hood vent here. Uh, light and fan, uh, very basic operation, very much as to what you're used to, I'm sure. Um, cooktop here, propane burning cooktop uh, with a sparker. So we turn it to light, uh, of course, uh, rotate that until we see the flame. Uh, oven, you're going to be lighting a slightly different way. Uh, you'll turn that from the off position here into the pilot position and hold that in. Uh, we're then going to take a long stem barbecue lighter and if we look down here, we have two prongs. Uh, this is always, we always have trouble getting this on film, but if we look down here, we have two prongs. You're going to take your flame uh, and put it directly in between those two prongs until you see the pilot light. Uh, from there, uh, give it a few seconds longer to heat that thermal coupler up. Uh, once you have done so, it's going to stay lit. You can go ahead and choose your temperature here on the knob. Uh, moving on, we have a GFI protected outlet up here. Now that is a resettable outlet. All the outlets uh, within the unit are on the same circuit. So if one of them were to get overloaded, uh, they were all would all follow suit. And that is going to be the reset location. Uh, we also have your uh, light here. Uh, again, you have different brightness settings uh, on that three-way switch. Easy on off, um, no big deal. Uh, windows, for the most part within the unit, are going to be the same. We have a 
uh, unlock here. From there, we can go ahead and slide that open, uh, very close to like a residential style window. Uh, you also have these uh, pull down shades and just about every window is going to operate the same within the unit. Uh, coming over here, we have your solar charge controller. Uh, that's essentially the brains for the rooftop mounted solar panel. Uh, that's gonna give us uh, voltage readings, uh, how much we're taking in, uh, how many amps we're taking in uh, via solar, things like that. So it is just kind of an information center uh, for that solar. So we have your uh, Kenwood stereo here. Uh, this is a, a automotive head unit, uh, works very similar uh, in function. This has a, a ton of stuff or a ton of options here. Uh, so we hold the, the power button, uh, that's going to turn it on. And then of course I already was in some menus there. Uh, Spotify, Pandora, Android compatible, things like that. Of course, Bluetooth, radio. Uh, CD, DVD is going to directly communicate with the television uh, via an HDMI arc. Uh, does carry its own service manual. I, it, there's a ton of stuff going on. Uh, I would definitely consult that uh, service manual. One thing that I do like to point out to my customers, though, is is the the way that you utilize the zone, the speaker zones, because you have three zones or uh, three zones of speakers uh, within the unit, which is uh, just means you have three sets of speakers. Uh, one for the outside, one for like the kitchen, dinette area, and then one for the bed area. Uh, when it does come to like controlling where you're pushing that sound or that music, uh, you want to go into that fader balance. Uh, and of course you see this is of course set up like the inside of a car. Uh, if I move this little green crosshairs all the way to, you would say the front of the, the car, but uh, in our scenario, that's going to be your outside speaker. So if it's towards the front, that's going to be the outside. If I move it all the way towards the rear, that means the only speakers that are going to be on are the ones above the bed. If I put it right there in the center, that means that all of the, the speakers are going to be on uh, with a similar intensity. Uh, it's a little hard to, little hard to, to kind of visualize, but uh, think of it in those terms and, and you'll probably be just fine. Uh, if you're looking at a CD or listening to a CD or DVD, you can just put that in the, the disc slot up front. Uh, and again, just consult the manual. Uh, it will be very helpful uh, in, in kind of getting deeper within those settings. Uh, down below here, we have your convenience center, your system monitor, uh, courtesy panel goes by many names. Uh, this is going to give you a real-time readout of where your uh, tank and battery sit and level of full. Uh, gray water is uh, just about a third or empty. Uh, black water is empty. Uh, fresh water is full. Uh, so we're reading here on this scale and I don't know if my hand's blocking that when I, when I push the button. And then battery is full as well. So the more lights we see on that scale, uh, the better we are. Now one thing to keep in mind is that uh, your battery is going to read full anytime you're plugged into shore power. Um, because uh, the converter is putting 13 five volts to the battery, uh, indicating a, an always full charge. Now, to get a true readout, you're going to have to unplug from the wall, and then we're gonna go ahead and test from this location. That's going to give us a more accurate battery reading. Then hopping down here to the toggle switches, excuse me, uh, this is going to give you, um, you know, this is how you're going to control most of those appliances or lights, uh, water pump, of course, the light means that it's on. That's how we're running the, the system right now. Uh, we have that 12 volt system pressure, that 12 volt water system pressurized uh, and drawing that water up from the tank uh, to the fixtures. Uh, porch lights going to be the uh, bright white LEDs that we saw on the outside. And cab over lighting is go just going to be all of the power uh, on, the, uh, on the cab over. So the, the idea being that if you uh, hop down from, from that location, uh, instead of having to crawl back into bed, you can just cut power uh, to that part of the camper from this location. Uh, and then down below we have your water heater sources. We have your uh, propane is going to be the middle switch, uh, 110 volts going to be the switch there on the right. Uh, and again, as I expressed on the outside, you can use both sources. That's gonna give you the highest recharge rates. Uh, from there, uh, other than that, just use these sources as they present themselves. 
Uh, if we go ahead and we flip on this gas light initially, of course everything's up to temperature so it's not going to do it for me now, but this red light's going to come on uh, with this gas switch. Essentially this is your indicator on whether or not it is actually lit on propane. Uh, it may flick on and off while it's going through its lighting cycles, but ult ultimately if you come back five minutes later and that uh, red light is on here, uh, that means that the water heater did not light, uh, that we do need to, to investigate uh, as to why it didn't light. Oftentimes, uh, either you're out of propane gas or maybe your valve is just closed on the tank, but either way, uh, investigate that if you, you don't find, if, if you uh, don't find that either one of those scenarios is the issue, uh, maybe just as simply as the propane has not uh, made its way through the line to the appliance. Uh, either way, uh, in the event of any of those scenarios, you can go ahead and turn the uh, water heater switch off. If you turn it back on, it's then going to start a new cycle, uh, which is three lighting cycles. And then again, if it does not light by the end of that third cycle, it's going to go ahead and illuminate that light. Um, thermostat is here, your Air Excel thermostat. It has a single mode button here. Um, and then you have your uh, temperature arrows here. So if I go ahead and I look here, uh, we would start here in the off position. I'm going to uh, hit it one time. That's going to take us into the fan uh, option. We have fan low and high. That's of course just straight fan, no conditioned air. And if I keep going through these scenarios there, we have cool high and cool low. Uh, now that would be an always on fan. So uh, what that means is of course where we have conditioned air, it's working properly, but that fan's going to run indefinitely whether or not we reach this set temperature. If I hit it one more time, that's going to take us into the auto side of things. Uh, that means that's going to operate more like a traditional thermostat where uh, if we go ahead and reach that 85 degree set temperature that everything's going to go ahead and shut down. Uh, and then we of course have the high fan speed as well. Uh, next up is going to be furnace. Now in that furnace mode, uh, once it realizes kind of what I'm doing, it's going to kick that blower motor on uh, immediately. 16 seconds after that, it's actually going to ignite and start producing heat. Uh, often in a time, uh, in a unit of this size, uh, it's going to set off the smoke alarm within the first 15 minutes of operation. Uh, per manufacturer specifications, that is totally acceptable uh, as the appliance continues to run uh, within the first 15 minutes, that efficiency rating goes way up and it's going to stop doing that. Uh, so if that happens to you, of course, don't be an alarmed. Uh, again, per manufacturer's recommendations, it's totally acceptable. Um, so that just about carry, uh, takes care of it, of, of kind of a lot, all of the stuff we had going on here at this wall. Um, sink, uh, it has this nice heavy duty countertop extender, which I do enjoy. Uh, other than that, you have a single base stainless steel sink. It's a beautiful sink. Uh, sprayer uh, does have multiple options there. You can go ahead and pull that out if you're inclined to do so. Uh, beautiful, beautiful, very usable sink. Uh, down low here, we have your fuse panel breaker box. Uh, on the left side there, we have your uh, resettable household style 110 volt breakers. Uh, of course, those should be uh, very close to what you're used to seeing at your fuse panel breaker box at home. Everything there on the right side is going to be a replaceable automated, automotive blade style fuse. Uh, it's going to be my recommendation that we do pick up a few spares in each one of those uh, ratings. And everything is going to be clearly marked in terms of function here uh, on the front. Uh, really good idea to keep some spares with you. Uh, that's going to uh, keep you from having to, to pick and choose which appliances uh, you're running in the event that they do uh, burn out. Um, here on the other side, we have uh, a propane carbon monoxide leak detector as well as a propane leak detector. Uh, that has a test button on that's wired into the 12 volt section of the camper. So it kind of secondarily functions uh, as a low battery alarm, as well as there is no battery to change within the unit. So it is, uh, again, a part of the 12 volt system. You will find a fuse for that in the fuse panel breaker box. If I go ahead and, and lift this compartment up here, uh, we of course have this secondary storage area, but if we go further and we pull that out, uh, that's going to expose uh, your water tank, your converter down here, uh, if you lose uh, 12 volt power when plugged in uh, or your battery's not charging, keep in mind you do have a couple fuses right there on the converter. 
Uh, also, my main reason for uh, removing that is to uh, show you this vacuum line here. A little bit of antifreeze still in the line, uh, but this is where we are going to introduce that inflow of antifreeze if we are doing a winterization process. Now, a full winterization process, we're going to purge all of the water from the system like we talked about there on the outside. Uh, and then we're gonna use this location to fill up those lines uh, with antifreeze. So you take this white hose, you take your bottle of antifreeze, and you're gonna put this white hose uh, in your bottle of antifreeze. Uh, from there, we're going to turn this valve into that secondary location. Uh, from there, we're going to flip on the water pump switch and we're gonna go from fixture to fixture, uh, kitchen, bathroom, outside shower, toilet, all of those. Uh, we're going to turn them on once we see pink at the fixture, uh, that is our indicator that we uh, have fully winterized the unit. So uh, make sure once you, once you see it at the fixture, you let it run for a few seconds longer. Uh, that will uh, make sure you fill up the P-trap on the way, uh, uh, way down. So very easy to do. Uh, a lot of people aren't aware of this stuff located here in this compartment. Uh, so I like to go ahead and make sure we point it out. We're gonna go ahead and put this back. Good to go. Uh, also, uh, in this closet here, I'm not going to, to set it up for you, uh, but you do have a counter uh, countertop extender uh, that's going to utilize this uh, little shelf as well as this uh, cleat there in the wall. Uh, and again, that extends this countertop for you. If you're doing any meal prep or anything, it's an excellent option to have. Uh, over here into the uh, refrigerator, uh, now this is a two-way refrigerator. It's going to run on propane gas as well as 110 volt electricity. Uh, if we go ahead and we uh, turn, push the power button on, we see the green light, uh, that means it's on. It's gonna kick us right there into that auto mode. Uh, on that auto mode, uh, if we see that A in the plug, that, that, that means we're in auto mode. Uh, what that means is it's going to uh, default to AC voltage if it's available. If it's not available, it's going to automatically start lighting on gas. Now, if I hit that mode button one more time, it's going to kick us into standalone electricity. Uh, if our power supply gets interrupted at that point, there's not going to be any automatic switch over to gas. If I hit it one more time, that's going to kick us into that gas only mode. Uh, again, if, if we run out of gas, there's not going to be any automatic switch over to a secondary uh, power source. Now this is going to be your going down the road option is going to be propane. Uh, we have temperature control here. The more snowflakes we see, uh, the colder it is. And also this is going to be your indicator. So if I were to put this on gas and it were, fail, were to fail to light, this green light is going to switch over to red. So that's also going to be an indicator light. Uh, if we go ahead and open up the door, uh, we're just going to see a normal kind of dorm style refrigerator. Same with the freezer, uh, again, very indicative of what you would see with like a dorm style refrigerator. So nothing too crazy with that. Uh, up top here, we have your nine volt smoke alarm. Uh, very, very much the same as what you're going to find uh, at home. Uh, and again, it's very important that we do test our safety equipment every single, single time we take the unit out. Uh, we wanna make sure that's in good tip top shape. Uh, here into the dinette area. Uh, now this is my favorite dinette setup. It's very easy to make this into a, a, a bed. Um, to do so, of course, we're going to move the cushions out of the way uh, to start out. Of course, I'm not gonna do that for us right now. Uh, but if we look down low here, we have a locking bar and this is going to be our control over that locking bar. So if I swing that out of the way, I can then go ahead and lower this table down and it does take a, a little bit of uh, pressure to do so, uh, but I can continue coming down uh, until we reach these little uh, shelves too. If it rests there on those slats, uh, once I'm in that resting location, I can go ahead and lock this down. Uh, that's going to keep it from inadvertently coming up. So a very cool uh, dinette. It's very easy to, to uh, put up and down, uh, far more user friendly than like a standard pedestal style. Um, table. Uh, underneath here we have a, a secondary little kind of hidden storage location. Uh, what's in here is going to be your T-bar. I reference this on the outside uh, of the unit and this is how we're going to manually uh, bring in the slide. Of course we have our spline there uh, and then we 
we put it something like that, and this is going to allow us again to manually bring in that slide uh, after we've disengaged uh, the motor. Uh, storage uh, underneath each dinette cushion. Again, nothing too uh, crazy or out of the realm. Uh, light switch uh, is going to be right there on the fixture uh, for that space. Uh, moving here over into the cab over. Um, always kind of tricky to get some of this stuff on film, uh, but uh, if we start here on this side, we have your uh, secondary carbon monoxide alarm. Uh, this is one that is going to be in the cab over just because, of course, you're sleeping. Uh, carbon monoxide rises, so it's, it's nice to have it up there uh, towards the ceiling. Uh, this is going to be that countertop extender I referenced. Uh, and this is going to be the storage location for that. Uh, and then if I kind of crawl up here further, uh, we have your television in the, the out uh, or free floating uh, position where we can of course directionalize that uh, to wherever we're sitting uh, within the unit. Now if I go ahead and bring this back, it's going to go ahead and, and lock there into position. And then this is going to be our release chain here. So we have to pull that to allow that to come out into the common area. Uh, we have a standard 12 volt charging section here. It's going to house a couple USB chargers, uh, as well as a cigarette lighter style receptacle for a 12 volt TV. And then on the rooftop, we have an omnidirectional digital antenna. And this is going to be the antenna booster plate for that. Uh, if we have that red light on, that means that uh, that means that we have the antenna on the roof on. That means that we have the antenna on the roof on, uh, and we can go ahead and do a channel search, and it's going to bring in digital over-the-air television uh, from that signal. Now, if we push the off button, which is right next to that white cable line, uh, what that does is that frees up the the pathway for like an aftermarket satellite package. Uh, or a park cable service. So if you're using the antenna, that red light needs to be on. If you're using a park cable service specifically, that red light needs to be off. Uh, also, we have your fire exit right here. Uh, you have two handles on each side of the window. If your entry door is uh, blocked, uh, you can go ahead and yank this screen out of the way, open up both handles. That whole window pane is going to flip open, kind of like a doggy door, allow you to uh, escape from this location. Uh, other than the storage, I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Uh, we have a fan right above my head here. Now, this is a fantastic fan. Uh, we go ahead and open it, and then we can directionalize it here. We can either exhaust air uh, or bring air in from the outside. And then I have a speed setting here. So I have uh, three speeds, uh, and it does really get up and move a lot of air. Uh, excellent location for a fan like this, a very high-powered fan. Uh, and this is a 12 volt fan, so if you're off grid, uh, you know, you don't have uh, access to running the, the air conditioner, uh, you can go ahead and use this and it's going to bring in air, fresh air uh, from the outside. Uh, also, each side of the bed, uh, we have 110 volt outlets as well as charging uh, USB chargers. Uh, and then we also have uh, reading lights, switches going to be right there on the fixture. Uh, of course, you see kind of your user manuals all spread out here onto the bed. Uh, those, of course, will be uh, put back uh, and stored underneath the dinette location. That concludes the walkthrough here on the Arctic Fox 990. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the walkthrough. If you do have any questions or concerns, uh, please don't hesitate to give us a call. Thank you.